Good afternoon and welcome to Lunch Time Series, proudly powered by leadershipbydesign.co, where we aim to add value to people's lives. You can listen to us live every Wednesday and Thursday at lunchtime uh, on ebizradio.com. And uh, we talk about everything, leadership, coaching, and marketing. Um, you can also catch the Lunchtime Series on all your major podca podcast channels today. And in today's marketing and leadership segment, we have the wonderfully marvelous, uh, ever educating, fantastic marketing <laughs> communications expert. Craig Page, how are you doing, Craig? Kevin, I'm great. Thank you. Yeah, good to be chatting today. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited uh, for, for this conversation, a follow up to, to your conversation I really enjoyed last week with you on good old Gen Z. Yeah, I, you know, I, since we've had that conversation, I've actually made ref reference to, you know, people to go and see and listen to that conversation um, based on the fact that, you know, it's, it's so the, as a segment of our population, how, how they respond and how their behaviors are so much more different than, than we are. You know, and and why we actually need to pay attention. So, guys, if you if you haven't seen it, go and check it out on YouTube. Uh, very very interesting conversation around understanding the Gen Zers a little bit better, um, and how to speak to them and market to them and understand them just better. But I mean, Craig, today to, uh, to kick off the show, give us a bit of that reminder of last week's conversation. Because yeah, quite fantastic. great, Kevin. Yeah, thanks. So so yeah, as 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 we state, um, we we discussed the generation z and we got to look at what they're actually all about um and and the topic was well covered in the gwi.com report titled seven characteristics of gen z in 2023 the report was written by amelia henderson and was published on february the 15th this year so again really relevant and and current information let's take a quick look at those seven characteristics of gen z as noted in the report. So the first characteristic is they're money-driven and ambitious. Gen Z are 29% more likely than other generations to say they're money-driven and ambitious. They make the statement and claim it. Characteristic two is they love to travel. I'm sure I still have some Gen Z in me because that's really core to my being as well. <laughs> they, they believe that vacations will bring more more joy to their lives in the future and are more likely than older generations to say that they've actually purchased a vacation in the past six months. Characteristic three is they're prone to anxiety. They're most likely to report having a mental health issue over any other generation. And 29% of Gen Z given say they're prone to anxiety. It's a big, big percentage. Characteristic four is they're known to set boundaries. Gen Z rejects this hustle culture as having a work-life balance is, is, is really important for the generation with 72% of Gen Z being protective of their work-life boundaries. Characteristic five, they're avid gamers, not a surprise. Interaction and socialization plays a far greater role for Gen Z gamers compared to older generation whose primary reason for gaming is to actually unwind. Characteristic six is they're nostalgic, and this, this was a really great point. Many of the trends that Gen Z are bringing back are from before they were born. Um, so this is less about reliving the past for them, but actually more about what they feel was a simpler time. And the, the last characteristic is they use social media in a unique way. Gen Z uses social media as a search engine for answers, turning to TikTok ahead of Google and for information and advice from, from yeah, anything from beauty trends to, to financial management. And those are the key reminder points from last week, Kevin. Fantastic. Like I said, guys, go and check it out. It's a fantastic conversation. But moving on from Gen Zs, what are we going to discuss uh, today, Craig? Oh, Kevin, I came across a really, really interesting report titled A New World Disorder, Navigating a Poly Crisis. And, and it was the title that, that was really intriguing for me. And, and the word crisis, which is so relevant to, to the entire planet these days, I thought yeah, definitely warrants a read and review. The report was published by Ipsos Global Trends, and we've covered their, their, their annual trends previously. It was published in February 2023, again, incredibly relevant and, and, and current information. It was compiled by Ipsos consultants and researchers from around the world using qualitative and quantitative techniques. 
and their theory of change model helps us look at how change happens across several levels, Kevin. Yes, definitely intrigued, Craig. Tell, tell us more about the polycrisis. <laughs> okay, so, so first I wanted to address the meaning of this word polycrisis as, as it really is central to, to, to the report. So according to McGregorBoyle.com, we note the following. The generally recognized definition of a polycrisis is the simultaneous occurrence of several catastrophic events. Building on this, most experts agree that it tends to refer specifically not just to a situation where multiple crises are coinciding, but one where the crisis become even more dangerous than each disaster or emergency on their own. And yeah, just to set some context here, yeah, Kevin, McGregor Boyle is a company that provides permanent contract and project-based recruitment services within the financial services commerce and uh, commerce industry and public sector uh, um, sector across the world. So really great insights coming from a people-first approach in, in, in their definition. According to Zurich.com, we note the following. It is a sign of the chaos and uncertainty of recent times that people have been searching for new words to describe them. The Collins Dictionary word for the year 2022, for example, was permacrisis. Uh, in October last year, the historian Adam Tooze, writing in the Financial Times, brought an older term, polycrisis, back into fashion. And the word polycrisis was the word for the year in the 2022 Collins Dictionary. And the World Economic Forum in Davos, with the ultra-wealthy and, and you know, all the acolytes gathered to love this word, pontificate, declared 2023 the year of the polycrisis. And to set some context again, the report was fielded in 50 markets, Kevin, and included more than, take note, 48,000 interviews covering 80% of the global economy and 70% of the global population. And for those that didn't know, Zurich is a, a leading multi-line insurer serving people and businesses in more than 200 countries around the world, in addition to providing insurance protection, which, which I know it for, Zurich is increasingly offering prevention services such as those that promote well-being and enhance climate resilience. Craig, you know what's what's scary about it, and that there's now a word for it, is that yes. you know, the, <laughs> the moment there, you know, like it's the same old, same old reasoning behind human behavior. The moment you you label it, um, it's it it's real, right? Yes. And that's what scares me about the word. It's, um, but I mean, what is it? What, what is the report tell us about <laughs> crisis? Okay, so, so the report opens with an important analysis of the status of, of the world, Kevin, as, as noted by Billy Ng, who's the global head of trends and foresights at IPSA Strategy 3. So, so let me share a few key points from, from the exec summary. The world isn't in crisis. The world is in crises. We're entering a new world disorder. We can no longer afford to focus on the big issues at hand because there are many interrelated issues at play. And the third paragraph notes the following. The biggest concern is an economic crisis that is shaping an economic divide and raising questions around the role of business. While this looks different in markets, like Argentina, for instance, which has faced high inflation since as early as the 1980s, overall, the world is most concerned about inflation and energy costs. Kevin, this is an important statement here. It says, we are seeing a movement away from shareholder value at all costs to a greater understanding of the human and environmental toll that capitalism takes. And the reason I like this, this sentence is because we addressed this, I think, two, two conversations ago. We were saying where shareholder value has been driving business and decision-making, and really that, that needs to have some kind of disruption because environment and, and, and human understanding is, is, is really key. So it then goes on to say, yet we know that purpose-driven buying is often trumped by cost sensitivity. So what happens when cost and purpose are in even greater conflict? And then the, the exec summary goes on to list a number of other points, but concludes with the following statement. The crises will not go away anytime soon. The world order that has lasted since the Second World War is splintering. Dominant institutions are falling. Populations are in conflict and opposition groups are sowing discord. And yeah, Kevin, these are, these are really seriously concerning points for, for people and planet, hence the 
advancement of this world, word to or concept to to 2023. Yeah, uh, you know, the the world order, like like. <laughs> Yeah, yes. You know, like, what, what, who are those people? Like, I'd like to meet them and like to sit them down and kind of go, like, who gave you the right to be the order of the world in the first place? Um, so, you know, when you when you contextualize it to this degree, you kind of go, well, maybe it's it's about time that the world order falls to pieces and you know, like things change. You know, um, the yeah. I, I, takes me back to the TikTok conversation and America trying to ban TikTok, you know, around freedom of speech, like because people are blatantly and simply lied to just, you know, they are told lies all the time. And I think we, we've got to a point in our, in, on the planet where we're kind of just huffle. We just like, we're done. We like enough with enough with the trying to hide and veil information to that degree um so you know I, like when you when you unpack it, it it makes more sense um that we are in crises but i'm like in this context maybe it's not a bad thing yeah yeah correct but it, it, yeah, i'd love to know who who all the members of the world order are if you're a conspiracy <laughs> theorist which there's you know lots of speculation around um conversations that are very current you know the soroses or the fauci's or the you know, is Donald Trump one of them? Who the hell knows in, 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 in that regard? You know, BlackRock. Um, he owns most of the planet. You know, <laughs> and, and you know, Gates. Who, who, who knows from, from that point of view? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, with, with this report, uh, so, so what are the, some of the trends and the insights you, you can share from the report? So, Kevin, the report covers six macro forces that, that have, really deep and far-reaching impact within the countries um, and, and across borders. And, and obviously through that affects societies, markets, and people. So, so the six macro forces listed are firstly, societies in flux, which notes that 68% of the world's population will be living in urban areas by 2050, up 47, uh, up from 40%, uh, 47% in 2000, apologies. The second point is tech acceleration. Um, and it notes that the global ratio of robots to employees in manufacturing um, has doubled since 2015, sitting at 141 robots to 10,000 employees. Third point is inequalities and opportunities, noting that one third of the world will be in recession by 2023. And I think that is probably you know, achieved already. The fourth point is environmental emergencies. Um, as of 28 July, 2022, it was registered as the Earth Overshoot Day when the demand for natural resources has exhausted what the Earth can naturally generate. And that's quite a scary, scary statistics, a statistic. Um, the fifth point is political splintering. And, and it notes that five million US dollars is the average cost of a data breach incident in 2023. Again, significant impact. Um, and finally, Kevin, um, macro force number six is well-rounded well-being, which tells us that one in eight people globally live with a mental health disorder. And you saw the, the results last week when we looked at the percentage of anxiety and, and mental health uh, issues within Generation Z, really, really of major concern. But Craig, again, as the eternal optimist, as much as these are the crises, it, 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 the contrast to this conversation is it creates a wonderful opportunity for the evolution of of the problems we're solving as businesses so you know like you can look at it from a like a, a crisis perspective and 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 negate and become quite negative about a lot of things but if you look at them in context to well, what is the opportunity for us to solve what is the opportunity for us to evolve and start taking care of it to that degree because absolutely and uh, yeah and 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 i think that's that's why ipsos uh, um report global trends report is is in place because it really it's able to identify what those trends are and work with those trends to inform shape and move business people and planet forward given in a constructive way so about that that what can you share about the global trends report so what does that report tell us 
So, so Kevin, in, in the report, we, we note 36 global values and 12 trends. And I'll just quickly list the 12 trends and then, and then give you a, a brief overview of each of those. So trend number one is climate antagonism. Trend number two is conscious health. Trend number three is authenticity is king. Trend number four is data dilemmas. Number five is the tech dimension. Trend number six is peak globalization. Trend number seven is a divided world. Trend number eight is capitalism's turning point. Trend number nine is reactions to uncertainty and inequality. Trend number 10 is search for simplicity and nostalgia, very much in the Gen Z space. Trend number 11 is search for simplicity and meaning. And trend number 12 is choice choices over healthcare. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm just reading them again. I'm kind of like just looking at it. But can you provide us brief overviews of the trends mentioned, Craig? Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. Um, the, the, the report has got a lot of detail. I think the report's about 127 pages long and, and definitely worth our, our, our listeners you know, taking a look and downloading it. But you know, yeah, in the show, I'll just give a very quick one or two liner summary on, on each of the points listed. So the first point here again, climate antagonism. So, so there's much debate who's actually responsible for climate change and how to address it. And we know, you know, if you chat to Trump, you'll get a very different answer to, to the next person. Um, we know that some consumers are changing how they're making purchasing decisions according to the environmental impact. The likes of Gen Z putting the responsibility squarely on the shoulders of governments, systems and corporations. Not incorrect in that regard. Point number two, trend number two is conscious health. Health is becoming a more holistic requirement, taking into account multiple meanings of well-being. And this interconnectedness of, of health with other systems has also been examined, Kevin, just as, as a key priority to address inequalities. The, the third trend is authenticity is king. Um, yeah, the, the days when corporations could just focus on providing good products or services at good price and expect the markets to respond are fading with the key requirement not to take consumers for granted because consumers are asking a lot more questions around these products and services the fourth trend is data dilemmas you know and and we all question who has our data and what they're actually doing with it we spoke about this just you know a few three shows ago, uh, ago but but really is how much do people really care what's been done with their data um, and and perhaps more importantly are they actually willing to do something about it? Are they gonna really leverage the power of that data to get something in return from the brands or in helping shape the world in a more positive way? The fifth point here is tech dimension and, and the rap rapid race of technological change and disruption over the past few decades is, is yeah, can never be understated. However, many people are wondering whether they, the, the promises made by these big tech companies um, have been kept and in reality, what do we need to do collectively to harness the potential of tech and mitigate some of the risks associated with it, um, like you know some of the negative repercussions of AI? The, the sixth trend is peak globalization. While the world remains divided on the pure benefits of globalization, increasing travel, greater cultural exchange, and, and the rise of cheap products actually represent multiple benefits to many people on the planet. The dilution of local cultures, perceived lifestyle, homogenization, increased consumerism, rising emissions, and, and faster habitat loss are among the critical impacts of globalization, though, Kevin. So, I mean, but I mean, so far, the, these six points that you've, we've just spoken about now, I don't see these as like concerning. I, I see these as really good. Uh, points of focus and areas of focus that that there should be a, a huge amount of awareness built around it. Correct, correct. Now, if if you look at each one in isolation, there are definite activities and initiatives that are that have been set up and been delivered on a daily basis around these principles. But when you consolidate, you know, we've been through the first six. But when you when you look at them, each and every single one is a challenge or represents a challenge that people and planet are faced with. And, and when, you, when you consider those collectively, that's where we get the poly crisis proposition. But in, in reality, whilst there are positives and, and, and constructs coming out of it, 
these all spawned out of the fact that they were crises initially. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so looking at the the second six here, point number seven is a world divided. So the pandemic could have united the world, um, you know, against the common enemy vis-a-vis -vis COVID, um, but instead forces worked to drive and expand wedges between people in many nations about precautions and the vaccines and, you know, wealthier nations getting vaccines first, uh, you know, poorer nations not, etc. Point or trend number eight is capitalism's turning point. And here we're seeing a movement away from shareholder value, as I mentioned earlier on, at all costs to a more holistic understanding of human environment's impacts of capitalism and the combined effects of the pandemic, the climate emergency and the cost of the living crisis may actually be driving a reassessment of individual goals and priorities. And, and for me, that's probably one of the most important trends here. Trend number nine is reactions to uncertainty and inequality. Uncertainty has become the only certainty. And, and people in many markets are facing economic instability as, as currencies are fluctuating. Uh, inflation is rising at a rapid rate. Supply chains are continuously disrupted and governments change on a regular basis. Financial inequality, however, is, is already a driver of change. And, and unfortunately, that worsened in the pandemic. The, the trend number 10 is the enduring appeal of nostalgia. As I mentioned, something really important for Gen Z. But you know, when the here and now is unpleasant, people are obviously faced with two means. Look back when times were happier and simpler, or try and look ahead to when times will get better. And, and I think the reality is we're seeing a lot more looking ahead because there's this positive movement, as you were saying earlier on. Um, right now, the, the, the second of these routes is, is definitely made all but impossible by the highly uncertain path into the future, which is really challenged by profound and potentially existential economic, environmental and, and geopolitical challenges. One of the biggest being obviously the war in Ukraine at this particular point in our lives. Trend number 11 is search for simplicity and meaning. COVID resulted in, in shrinking of people's world, given daily commutes were eliminated, living social lives and, and active balances of, of commitments were impacted on. And the increase to cost of living crisis is coupled with the, with the climate energy crisis has definitely resulted in people reevaluating their lives, reconsidering their hopes and ambitions, and then actually changing their spending patterns, which has resulted in a much smaller yet more fulfilling life than it was before for many individuals. And that's a positive takeout. And trend number 12 is choices over healthcare. And, and again, the pandemic is, is, a, is a catalyst to a lot of these triggers where the pandemic required government-led oversight, legislation and enforcement with, with the longer term trend here has been for people to want more direct access to healthcare, want more control over the solutions and outcomes. And here consumers continue to want more access to providers and specialists, regardless of their location and more control of their own well-being, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, again, Craig, uh, listening to this, I think it's these are fantastic points. And, you know, I love the, the, the simplicity and meaning. Yes. Uh, you know, because it's it's really pushed the agenda of people like, you know, people's values of where do I work? Why do I work here? And am I happy? You know, and um, the the realization that life is far more precious than we've given it uh, meaning before, before COVID happened. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, COVID was in a way uh, such a catalyst for us to to bring more meaning to our lives. Um, you know the 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 tiny house revolution. I don't know if you've if if you've seen that on T. Yeah, or fantastic. YouTube. Really enjoy it. People are scaling down and they grow. I mean, in my garden currently, we have eggplants, tomatoes, and uh, spinach that we grow and we make dinner out of the our food out of our garden. Like it's it's just <laughs> it's just a mind shift and. It's very possible for you, you can grow, you can literally grow eggplants out of a pot plant. It's, you know, it's like you can literally, it's, it's, but it's that mind shift that I think is, is necessary. So I'm thinking, you know, hearing it now, Polychrist, I think that's, 
that that wording is is fear mongering a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All you know, a poly poly situations of what we find ourselves in. Um, but I think these points are, are significant because it does give us a really good sort of foundation of you know how to move forward into the the world in the next twenty years and you know what the evolution of man and business will look like. I think it's fantastic. And, and, and that's an important thing, the evolution of man and business in respect of these, these 12 points, because, you know, what are brands and marketers doing to, to understand how their brands and organizations fit into each of these points to bring value to, to the world, to bring value to these crises, but also to bring value to, to their consumers, prospective consumers in, in a meaningful and enduring and sustainable way. Absolutely. So, I mean, Craig, as we end today's show, what are the key takeaways that we can share with the listeners? So, Kevin, I want to reference the closing summary page from the report as, as the takeaway points for today. And, and, and these points are noted as follows. While many people around the world feel that 2022 has been a little better, uncertainty about both short and longer term futures prevails. That's the challenge, though, uncertainty. We need more certainty. The next point is global citizens are struggling to be optimistic about 2023, with most expressing concern about the state of the economy, the environment, and world security as a whole. And I think that last point is, is, is really a critical point to, to be very cognizant of. There are widespread expectations of fresh challenges for the economies around the world, the climate and the role of technology, and obviously the pervading concern about, again, re-emphasize world security. So from an economy point of view, expectations are for the economies around the world to worsen in 2023 with large numbers expecting the following to rise. So 79% expect prices to rise. 75% of, of, of individuals participating in the report expect inflation to rise. 74% expect interest rates to rise. And 68% percent expect unemployment figures to rise, which, you know, if you just look at what's happened in big tech since since January this year, you know, that's that's a reality. The onset of that is, is not going to stop anytime soon either. So from an environment point of view, expectations are noted as follow, Kevin. 68% of participants in, in the report expect more extreme weather events next year than in 2023. And we already seen some of the most extreme we've experienced in our life. So Goodness, what are we in for? 57% think that 2023 will be the hottest year on record in their respective country. That's a proof point that that's already been achieved in, in some countries, with 45% expecting a natural disaster to hit a major city in their country. From a world security point of view, that you know, a topic that's come up a couple of times in, in, in the trends, expectations are noted as follows. 48% think it is likely that nuclear weapons will be used in a conflict somewhere in the world, up from 34% in 2022. So that's almost a 50% rise in expectation, Kevin. And yeah, um, this feeling is increased by more than 10% in 25 of 31 countries participating in the report. And finally, Kevin, from a technology point of view, the expectations are noted as follows. 47% of participants expect a space rocket to be launched to Mars in 2023. Well, that's a tick. 39% expect space tourism service moon trips to launch in 2023. I think that might have to wait a bit longer since uh, yeah, Virgin Galactic hasn't quite uh, been able to do its launch. And, and finally, 27% expect brain implants to restore lost memories to be possible in 2023. And those are the key takeaway points for today's show, Kevin. <laughs> we're living in the future, like we're literally in the future, right? We're living um, beam me up Scotty kind of uh, vibes here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Quote of the day, guys, is it's better to fall in... No, hang on. Let me start that again. Quote of the day is it's better to fail in originality than to succeed in imitation. And that's from Herman Melville. Um, but Craig, thank you. Thank you for, for giving us some really good insights about the poly crises that we need to be aware of. I think these points are extremely poignant and, and a really good, uh, interesting part of like, you know, how to steal business, how to, 
uh, how do you start paying attention to the things that are matter that that, that are going to be mattering uh, or have more substantial weight in the in, in the coming uh, the coming years. Mm-hmm.